Good morning, church. Are you excited to be at church this morning? Man, the last 9.30 service. This is it. This is it. This is the final one. They asked me, hey, can you preach the last Sunday of the, the three service schedule? And I felt honored, like, wow, the last one. The last, I get to preach the last 9.30 service. And then I realized, no, they just want me to preach all three services. They don't, they don't want to preach three again. They're, on, they're already on the two service mindset. So here we are, the last 9.30 service. If you're watching on live stream, the last live stream 9.30 service, we're going to start live streaming the 8.30 service beginning next week. So make sure you're online at to, on time uh, or you can go back and watch it. But today I'm excited as we continue a series we started last week called Guided into the future, into the future. And we're in Psalm 23, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalm 23. And last week we started uh, in Psalm 23, and in, in verse one this says, the Lord is my shepherd. All right, the eight o'clock service, I don't know if they just had more coffee, but they were a little more excited about that point, all right? So let's, let's try this again, 930 service. The Lord is my shepherd. There it is. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. Some of you are shaking your head like, yes, the Lord is my shepherd. And you, and you have made that decision. Some of you, uh, maybe you didn't have enough coffee and you're just looking at me like, what is happening right now? Some of you are like, I'm not real sure about this. But I want you to see something this morning is that the Lord, the statement, the Lord is my shepherd, it's important for you to know that everyone has a shepherd. Everyone has a shepherd. Everyone has someone or something that is leading, guiding, and directing their life. Maybe uh, for some people in the room, you are your own shepherd. You are the only person who can tell you what to do, you where to go. For some of you, it's, a, it's another person. Maybe it's something, it's, it's money, it's work. You have something that is leading, guiding, and directing you. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. If the Lord is a shepherd, that would make us what? Great job. You guys are really putting this together today. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. Now, I know sheep are adorable, and they're soft, and they're, they're cute, and they're cuddly, but this isn't the greatest compliment that we could get, uh, that we are like sheep, but it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, when I was looking in this week of, of you know, what do sheep do, uh, sheep aren't the best thinkers for themselves. Uh, I was reading that sometimes sheep uh, will start to eat and they will just keep their head down and they will continue eating uh, until they die. They'll just eat themselves to death. Or sheep will always wander off. Or, or I read one uh, thing that was telling me that sheep, if there's not a shepherd leading them, they will just follow each other and they have literally been known to follow each other right off a cliff because they don't have a shepherd. It sounds, it sounds like, wow, that's crazy. Why would someone let someone else lead them off of a cliff? But it kind of sounds a little bit like us humans, that when we don't have a shepherd, when we're just following each other, we'll follow whoever right off of a cliff, that we'll do whatever we want, whatever feels good in a moment, and it will lead to our death. He is our shepherd, we are the sheep. But I love that this says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord is the shepherd. The Lord is a shepherd, even though he is a shepherd and he is the shepherd, but it says he is my shepherd. I love this because this means that there's relationship there. It means that there's a relationship that, that he is my shepherd and I am his sheep. That I know him and he knows me. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh my goodness, 930, come on. The Lord is my, shepherd. there it is, the Lord is my shepherd. And today we're gonna to be picking up in verse four. It says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Let's, let's pause right there. If you're taking notes this morning, uh, I want you to write down the word through, or if you have your Bible, underline that word, even though I walk through the darkest valley. We're gonna hit more on that later, but it says, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. Notice this doesn't say, uh, I will see no evil. It doesn't say there will be no evil. It's saying I'm gonna see it, there will be it, but I have no fear of it. It'll be around me, why? Because he is with me. Because he's with me, he 
is there with me that I don't have to fear. And then it says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. Now, this isn't the type of comfort that would be like, oh, this is so comfortable. Oh, the rod and the staff, they're so cozy, like how some of you are waiting to, to go home and to get into your lazy boy, cover up with the blanket, fall asleep watching football all day, that type of cozy. That, it's not that type of comfortable. Uh, the rod and the staff really aren't very comfortable things. These are the two things that a shepherd would use in the field. The rod uh, would be like a stick that a shepherd would use to beat whatever comes to attack the sheep. So if a lion comes, if a, a bear comes, whatever comes towards the shepherd, this is the main form of defense that they would use to, to beat that animal, to, to defend themselves and the sheep. The staff, uh, the staff would be a long stick, you know, have a hook on the end, and the staff would be used to hit the sheep if they start getting out of line, if they start wandering off, that they would hit the sheep uh, to get them back. That doesn't sound very comfortable to me. At the end of the staff is a hook, and that hook, if a sheep falls down into a spot that the shepherd can't reach, they would flip the staff around, go down, and they'd pick it up, and they'd put it back where it needs to go. So how does a beating stick and a hook sound comfortable? How do those comfort me? Here it is, here it is. The reason that his rod and his staff, they comfort me, is because if he has the rod and if he has a staff, I don't have to. That if he has the rod, he is defending me, therefore I don't have to defend myself. He is fighting for me, I don't have to fight anything. And because he is fighting the battle for me, I am comfortable in that. Because he has a staff that might hit me and it might not feel good. Sometimes we as sheep, we begin to wander. We as sheep, we stray off from, from the rest of the herd and we get to a spot where the shepherd has to come in with a hook and he has to reach down and pull on us. And it's not going to feel good in that moment, but it is necessary to get us back in with the herd. And because the shepherd has the rod, because the shepherd has the staff, I find comfort in that. I find comfort in that, that he is with me, that, that his rod and his staff that they comfort me. And then it says, you prepare a table, verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup, it overflows. Did you know that God has so many blessings for you that, that it will overflow? That it overflows, isn't that amazing that he gives you everything you need and more? It's enough for you and for people around you that your cup, it overflows. But this says, the, the, one of the key things I want to look at this morning is this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. A table in the presence of my enemies. This reminds me of a story in Daniel chapter 3. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 3. In Daniel chapter 3, uh, we see three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three are told uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar, actually everyone is told by King Nebuchadnezzar, that... When you hear music, you are to bow down and worship this idol. King Nebi, he, uh, he built this idol that out of gold, 90 feet tall, nine feet wide. He's saying, hey, music plays, you bow down. Well, these three men, uh, they follow God's law and they said, well, hold on a second. We are told that we aren't supposed to worship anyone else. We are to have no other God except the one true God. So they find themselves in a tough spot. Should we bow down so that we can live or do we follow the law. The music plays, they don't bow down. King Nebuchadnezzar, he hears about it. He calls them in. He says, hey, I'm gonna give you one more chance. I'm gonna play the music, and when I do, you bow down and you worship. And look at what it says uh, in Daniel chapter three, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But look at verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So they have this faith where they say, my God can do it. My God can do anything. My God will do it. But this is the faith that I think some people in the room need to begin having this morning, that even if he doesn't, I'm still gonna worship him. Maybe you're here this morning and you're going through something where, where maybe it's, a, it's cancer, it's a sickness, it's something with your family, it's something going on financially, it's something going on at work, and you get to the point where you have faith that says, my God 
can do this. My God will do this, but even if he doesn't heal me, even if he doesn't do those things, he is still good and I am still going to worship him. Can we be a church that has an even if faith? That even if it doesn't work out how I think or how I want, he is still good and I still praise him. My God can save me, my God will save me, and even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. These men wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then, oh, this is where it gets good. Then, King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who's who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Does that story get you excited? Does that get you fired up that they had this faith that said, my God can, my God will, and even if he doesn't, I'm still gonna praise him. Even if he doesn't, he is, he is still good. The king, he gets upset about it. He heats up the fire. He throws them into the fire. Now, I think for lots of us, at least for me, myself, uh, as, I, as I think through this, if I got to this point where I stood up against the king, where they said, you have to do this, and I have this faith that says, no, I'm not going to. My God can save me. My God will save me. It's kind of like the adrenaline. I picture like the adrenaline's pumping and you're like, God's about to show up. And what you picture is uh, all of a sudden God's gonna swoop down. He's gonna pick you up and save you and he's gonna kick King Nebuchadnezzar into the fire. And in that moment, when God takes me out of the, out of the problem, when I don't have to go into the fire and when the enemy, when he has to go into the fire, that's revival. That's, that's this big moment and that's God working through me. But can I tell you this morning that that's not how it works. That's not that's not how it works. What what happens here? They get thrown into the fire. They go into the fire. There's this big moment. They're all excited. God's going to save us. Can you imagine the moment where these strong soldiers have them tied up, and as they're getting ready to push them in, that the flames are killing them, and you're going, "I am about to die." They. They're probably in their mind thinking, this is it, I, I am done, and they fall into the blazing furnace. We picture God's gonna reach in and, and save us, that's revival, but you know what happens? They get into the blazing furnace, and there's God. There he is. Even though I walk through the valley, even though I go through the fire, even though I go through the sickness, even though I go through the depression, even though I go through the anxiety, even though I go through the problem, I'm going through that. I think lots of times we want God to take us out of something and God's saying, no, I wanna work in this thing. How many things are we saying, God, take me out of this. God, help me get out of this. He's saying, no, I wanna take you through that. It's through that, let me lead you, let me guide you. It's through the fire. And then what happens? King Nebuchadnezzar, he looks in. Look, look, didn't we put three guys in there? I see a fourth. And there he is, there's, 
the Son of God. You know what it sounds like is happening in this blazing furnace? There's a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. In the presence, in, in the valley, in the fire, in the problem, there's a table that God prepared for them right there. And we picture that God is gonna come down and, and he's gonna rescue us out of that thing, but notice who takes them out of the fire? King Nebuchadnezzar. Man, I wonder how many times we're going through something. We're going through a fire. We're going through a valley. We're going through something. And people are sitting there and they're watching you. I know that they're a Christian. How are they gonna to respond to this? I know that they believe in Jesus. How, how are they gonna take this news of this sickness, of this disease? I, I, know, I know how I would respond. How are they going to respond? And as they watch you go through it, they say, well, I thought it was just them. I thought it was just their family, but it looks like they have been with Jesus. It looks like God is with them as they go through this. And what happens, God doesn't take you out of that. He uses the enemy and the enemy comes in. That's revival right there. Where the enemy comes in and he says, oh, here's the revival. No one can talk bad about their God. And if they do, they're cut into pieces. Houses turn into rubble. They're going through it. I don't know what you're going through this morning. What pain, what, what hurt, what event in life you're going through. But can we make a decision today that we say, I'm going through it. I'm going through I don't need God to take me out of it. I'm deciding that I'm gonna follow him as we go through the valley, as we go through the fire. And it's there in the fire, it's there in the valley, it's there in the, the sickness, there he's prepared a table in the presence of the enemy. What does that look like, a, a table? I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a visual learner, so I need to, I need to learn this way. So let's say, let's say that at New Hope we're all family, we're all family, but let's say for a moment that y'all are my enemies, okay? Everyone in here, you are my enemy, and here I am, and I'm in the middle of the valley. Here I am, I, I'm in the middle of this. I, I'm, I'm in the middle of my enemies, but in the middle of my enemies, there's a table prepared for me. I, I, I'm right here, there's, there's a table. There's my enemy, there's my enemy, there's my en but there's a table right here, and at this table, there's me, there's a spot for me, and there's a spot right here for God. It's, it's me and God. There's enemies all around. The valley, it's dark, but, but there's a table for me in the presence of my enemies. But it says in the Bible that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. So the devil, he knows, he knows there's a table that God's prepared for you in the middle of the valley. There's a table he's prepared for you in the middle of the fire. There's a table that he's prepared for you in the middle of all of it. How do I get a seat at that table? How do I mess up what God's doing in their life? And he's prowling around like a roaring lion. Who do I devour? How do I devour? And notice this, that the, the enemy, uh, like a lion, he is very smart with how he works in this way. If you've ever seen anything about lions, like if there's a lion and a gazelle, and the gazelle's way over there, and the lion's way over there, if the gazelle's over there eating and they see the lion start coming up there, they don't just go, oh, there's a lion over there. I'll eat here for a little bit longer until he gets closer to me. No, the moment they see the lion, they turn and run. So the lion knows, I have to sneak up. I have to do something sneaky in order to get in. Where is the crack that I can get into this system? And he starts to whisper different things into your ear. He starts to work things. Notice that nobody uh, goes from, I've never had a taste of alcohol to the next day, I'm an alcoholic. Nobody goes from, I've never stolen anything to now I'm robbing a bank. Nobody takes a massive, nobody gets married and thinks at their wedding day, like, ah, this is gonna end in the divorce for sure. No one does that. Right? It's never that extreme, but Satan, he's looking for a crack. He's like a lion seeking who he can devour. He says, there's a table there. How do I get a seat at that table? Oh, yeah, your spouse, they don't really care about you. They care more about uh, work than they care about you. Oh, they don't respect you at all. They never help you with the kids. They'd rather do other things than, than spend time with you. And it starts as just this little crack. It starts as just this little whisper. And before you know it, now he's separated the two. It's, it's this table that he's prepared for you. And on one side, it's, it's God. And at one side, it's you. And what Satan wants is he wants to take a chair and he wants to pull it up and he wants to have a seat at this table. Why? Because when he has a seat here and there's God and there's you, what is he gonna start doing? Hey, hey, listen to this. He's, he's leaning over. He's trying to get your attention. 
It's in the middle of the battle. It's in the middle of your enemies. It's in the middle of the depression. It's in the middle of the anxiety. It's in the middle of the sickness that there's a table for you. And all that you need is that table. God at that table is everything you need and Satan wants to disrupt that. So how do we keep Satan from getting a seat at this table? It's very simple. It's I keep my eyes on him. I keep my eyes on God. I focus on God. I'm in my word. I'm surrounding myself with things that, that the enemy is not trying to use. I'm not opening up certain doors. It's, it's a one choice. It's one choice that leads to another choice. Think about these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What if they got to the point where they said, okay, we're gonna bow down and we're gonna pretend like we're worshiping this idol, but we're really gonna worship God. And then later it's, oh, we'll do that again, we'll do that again, until now before you know it, now they're worshiping the idol. It starts with one choice. It's one choice. But we keep our eyes on Jesus. We keep our eyes on on the Savior, we keep our eyes on the one who has prepared the table for me. And when we do that, when we're in the middle of the battle, when we're in the middle of the valley, when we're in the middle of the fire, and there's enemies all around us, and our focus is on him, I find comfort in that his rod and his staff, they guide me. We go into battle, and in battle, we've got our hands up like this, like I'm ready, I'm ready to fight, I've gotta fight my enemies. But here what we see is there's a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And the way that you win the battle is you keep your eyes on him. So we go from having this battle stance to we have this battle stance. We go from how do I fight this enemy off on my own to man, I find comfort that God's taking care of it, I worship him. My God can, my God will, and even if he doesn't, I'm still gonna praise him. I'm reminded of of a story in 2 Kings chapter six, worship team, you can come. 2 Kings chapter six, uh, we see two countries are, are at war. There's Aram and there's, there's Israel. And they're, they're at war and the, the, the king of Aram is wanting to attack and raid Israel. But Israel has a secret weapon, uh, a prophet named Elisha. And every time the king of Aram says something to his army, hey, this is how we're going to attack them, Elisha, gets this download from God and he knows exactly what they're wanting to do. The Bible actually says that the king of Aram couldn't even say something in his bedroom without Elisha knowing about it. And every time, every time he tries to attack, Elisha tells the king of Israel, hey, this is what they're gonna do. Hey, this is what they're gonna do. They always have a counter for how they're going to attack. Well, the king of Aram, he finds out. He finds out that it's Elisha, so he decides, I'm gonna take Elisha out. Look at what 2 Kings chapter six says. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out, so this is the servant of Elisha, went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked, don't be afraid. I will fear no evil. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There's a table that he's prepared for you in the presence of the enemy. In the valley, in the fire, in the darkness, and you look around, it's just my enemies. Everywhere I look, it's my enemies. The servant says, we're surrounded. Life says, yeah, we are. Open up his eyes. It looks like we're surrounded by the enemy, but we are surrounded by God. We are surrounded by him. He's working things that I can't even see. It's important for you to know, church, that we are in a battle. You are in a battle. Today, you might know exactly what that battle is that you're going through. Maybe you aren't really struggling with much of that. There is a spiritual battle going on all around us, and there's enemies surrounding us. But guess what? There's a table where the presence of God is stronger than the presence of any enemy. There's a table that he's prepared for you. And all we have to do is focus on him. The servant's eyes are open. He sees God's army is all around us. Elisha prays, God, make this, this army, make them blind. They all go blind. He leads them into the city. So they went from surrounding Elisha to now they go into the city. He has them open their eyes and now they are surrounded. The king of Israel says, what should we do? Should we, should we kill them? Should, should we kill them with our sword? No, 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 no feed them, give them a feast, and let them go home. Feed them, just let them go home. These, 
They're trying to kill us. Why would we feed them? My cup overflows. My cup, it overflows. The world wants to have a battle like this. Our battle's like this. They say, take out your enemy. I say, I don't have to. I find comfort that my shepherd has a rod, that my shepherd has a staff, that I don't have to do the hard work. He's doing the hard work. All I have to do is have my hands open. They feed them, they send them home, and they never try to raid Israel ever again. It was just staying with me all across the room this morning. Can we make a decision this morning, church? I'm going through it. I'm going through it. I, I feel like I'm surrounded. I feel like I'm in this valley. I feel like I'm in this darkness. I feel like I'm in this fire. I'm, I'm in this battle. But in the middle of all of that, I know that there's a table for me. In the middle of all that, I find comfort that my shepherd, he's watching over me, that my shepherd is fighting for me. And I don't have to fight my battles anymore. I don't have to swing my fists. I don't have to do all the hard work. He does the heavy lifting. All I have to do is I worship him. All I have to do is I focus on him. All I have to do is be in the presence of God. I don't know what it is you're going through this morning, church, but can we just lift our hands right now all across the room and just begin to praise God, saying, God, we worship you. God, we give you all the praise. I'm going through it right now, but this is how I'm choosing to fight. This is how I'm, I'm choosing to go about this valley, to go about this fire, is I worship you. Come on, church, let's worship him this morning. Come on, church, can you just raise a hallelujah right now with your own voice? With your hands, just giving him some praise right now. This is how we fight. In the presence of the enemies, I raise the hallelujah. I worship you, God. We focus on you. We're going through it. With every head bowed, every eye closed this morning, if you just say, I'm going through it, Pastor Zach. I'm going through it. It's been a battle. It's been a valley. It's been a fire. It's been tough. And I've been going through it. I've been going through it by myself. I've been going through it trying to fix it on my own, trying to fight it on my own. But today, today I decide I'm going through it. I'm not just making the announcement that I'm going through. I'm declaring I am going through this and I am being led by my shepherd. And I am choosing to fight a different way. I'm choosing to fight with my hands held. I'm choosing to fight with worship, saying, my God can, my God will. And even if he doesn't, I'm still going to worship him. If that's you this morning, you've been going through it today you're saying yeah I am gonna go through it from this point on following my shepherd would you just raise a hand just as a sign saying I'm going through it God thank you for every person every person in this room I I lift up the prayers for those with the hands up who have who've just been going through it going through a sickness going through depression, going through anxiety, going through work stuff, through family stuff, through financial stuff. And it's been a struggle because we've been trying to do it on our own, but I pray that today that they would take comfort in your rod and your staff. That today that we would learn to trust you. Today that we say, I have no fear as I walk through this valley. I have no fear as I go into the fire. I have no fear as I go to that appointment because my God is with me every head still bowed and eye closed maybe this morning you would say I've been my own shepherd I've been leading myself I've allowed someone else something else but today I want to decide that God the Lord is my shepherd today I want to surrender to him and I want to follow him if that's you today and you saying I haven't been following him. he has not been my shepherd but today today I make him my shepherd would you just raise your hand God, I thank you for those saying, I make the Lord my shepherd. That as we walk, as we go through life, that no longer would we do things for how we see that they should be done, how we think they should be done, but we'd be led by you. That we wouldn't avoid certain situations because it might be difficult, it might be hard, but we would know that you are leading us and therefore it will be a good thing. God, we thank you that you are a good shepherd. We thank you that that you are my shepherd, that it is a personal relationship that you want to have with us. And I pray that as a church, as we're guided into the future, that we would learn to be guided by you, that we'd be learned to be guided by your staff, that it would lead us, that it would guide us, that we'd learn to be protected by you. 
and we surrender to you that our focus would stay on you, that our, our focus would be on your presence, not the presence of the enemies, but on the presence of you. We love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going through it. Turn to your neighbor you just ignore and say, I'm going through it. I'm going through it. I'm being led. I'm a sheep. He's my shepherd, and I'm allowing him to lead me. Man, we're going into the future. Amen. Amen. We hope to see you back tonight, 6 p.m. We're going to be in the, the new space, opening it up with a, a worship night. Come back and, and join us tonight as we spend some time worshiping the one true God.